discussion today pertains to a, a case that was considered by the court in Hong Kong, and it relates to dignity preservation. There are, of course, various means of doing so, uh, and Daisy will speak specifically to uh, some of the measures that we have here in Hong Kong. Uh, this mm -hmm. is not meant to be a comparative exercise because we do have eminent speakers presenting on the situation in the Netherlands and uh, also in Canada. Uh, we just want to introduce to all participants different perspectives and different approaches uh, to thinking about some very, very difficult issues. And I think it's very important for the audience here in Hong Kong, right, because we are still uh, considering the options available as we mm -hmm. chart the way forward. So having these perspectives, I think, uh, could contribute to the discussion in view of the fact that, of course, before COVID, uh, there has been a public consultation done by the local authorities to try to understand concerns mm -hmm. in end-of-life care and some mm -hmm. of the measures that uh, could be taken up moving forward. So with this, uh, one welcome again to all our online participants um, uh, who has joined us. And uh, it's over to my co-chair, Professor Gilberto Leung. He is a uh, professor uh, from the LKS School of Medicine at HKU uh, and co-director of the Center for Medical Ethics and Law, uh, of which I am his counterpart. Uh, at, at, at the law school. So with this, it's over to you, Professor Leong. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kelvin. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here. Uh, I am a doctor, so uh, I'm here uh, learning as much as I'm chairing um, the session uh, on behalf of uh, CML. Um, it's my pleasure also to introduce our first speaker, uh, Daisy, who is an assistant professor of law and deputy director and research fellow at the Center for Medical Ethics and Law at Hong Kong U. Uh, her research interests um, range very widely, uh, including mental health and mental capacity law. And she has published extensively on, for example, Hong Kong's mental health ordinance. Um, she's also um, interested in adult guardianship uh, regimes, as well as uh, advanced medical directives in Asia. Um, today, um, she's going to talk to us about um, advanced directives in Hong Kong, how that might apply to the, the case that uh, Kelvin had uh, outlined uh, for us. So over to you, uh, Daisy. Uh, thank you so much, Gilberto, for the very kind introduction. So I'm just going to share my slide. Okay, so um, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to be able to speak to you today, albeit from a very windy and cold Oxford here. Um, as Calvin has kindly and also Gilberto has kindly explained, my topic today will be on an option for advanced care planning, the advanced directive, which may assist in cases where the individual in question no longer wants to continue living life in a particular condition and wishes to refuse uh, further treatment and acts as a key way to preserve the dignity of those who are terminally ill. So in cases like the case that we will be discussing um, later on today, um, there are options um, in cases where the individual no longer or finds the life too difficult to continue can um, choose uh, uh, planning decision-making tools uh, to prepare for the end of life. So um, just as a bit of background, my uh, discussion of advanced directives in Hong Kong today takes place within the wider context of the development of uh, advanced directives in Asia, which is the focus of a book project that Michael Dunn from NUS and I have been working on for the past year or so, and will be released uh, early next year. And, and this one looks at the law and practice of advanced directives in 16 jurisdictions across Asia. So here on the slide, you can see a list of the different jurisdictions we've covered and how we we've organized them into categories for the book. For example, uh, under well-regulated jurisdictions or what we define as jurisdictions with a clear set of legal rules on or encompassing ADs. So this could be uh, legislation most commonly. And then also in India, there's very uh, clear judicial guidelines on ADs. This includes Israel, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, and India. And then we look at semi-regulated jurisdictions, which are defined as jurisdictions with other forms of regulations on ADs, such as regulation via official regulatory documents, practical guidelines, or other forms of guidance from professional societies. 
So this would include our jurisdiction of Hong Kong, uh, Iran, Malaysia, Philippines, and Turkey. And then, of course, we also have a look at some of the non-regulated jurisdictions where there might be, at best, broad principles contained in the legislation or guidelines around healthcare that stress the importance of patient preferences in general terms, but no regulations or guidelines um, that connect to AD specifically. And under this category, we look at China, Japan, Macau, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia. So... Um, I begin with a quick definition of what I mean by ADs in um, this, uh, as used in today's presentation and in our book, um, an advanced directive or an AD is a statement in which a person with mental capacity makes an advanced decision in matters concerning their health and welfare, which is to be implemented in the event that the person loses mental capacity in the future. And the modern idea of the concept of the AD, as it is used in the healthcare setting, is generally traced back to Louis Kuttner, who was an American human rights lawyer who wrote in the late 1960s. And while there is a very abundant literature on the concept and practice of ADs coming from Western jurisdictions, there was, um, to our surprise, a lack of comprehensive and systematic analysis of ADs in the Asian context, which our volume aims to address. So that brings me to the Hong Kong context, which is what I'll be talking about today. Um, and this discussion is taken from the chapter that I co-wrote with my colleague here at the law faculty, Associate Professor Rebecca Lee. So it's important to first note that as of now, um, there's currently no statute or local case law that clarifies the legal status of ADs, even though the common law principles that um, apply to advanced decisions, these are generally applicable um, in making valid ADs to refuse life-sustaining treatment in Hong Kong legally binding. So technically, the common law principles apply, but we don't have local case law on this, and of course, we don't have statute yet on this. So if we can just have a quick look at some of the historical developments relating to ADs in Hong Kong, and uh, we divide this into three stages. So stage one covers three key documents, the hospital authority's first edition of the hospital authority guidelines on life-sustaining treatment in the terminally ill, which was released in 2002, and which had a brief discussion of ADs, and practice was a reference was made to the practice in the UK at the time. Um, and in 2004, the Hong Kong Law Reform Commission, HKLRC, issued a public consultation paper entitled The Substitute Decision Making and uh, Advanced Directives in Relation to Medical Treatment. Uh, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this uh, important document and the results of which were uh, published in a report in 2006. So the HKLRC recommended that the government promote the concept of ADs under the existing common law framework instead, um, and so instead of by legislation, as it was at the time considered premature to legislate while the concept of ADs was still new to the community. And um, at, in 2009, the Food and Health Bureau, the FHB, issued a consultation paper in response to this HKLRC report. And the majority of views it received from the consultation agreed that a non-legislative approach to AD promotion should be adopted in Hong Kong. So here we can have a quick think about whether things have, are really so different uh, now and at that time in relation to people's uh, awareness and understanding of ADs. But um, in any event, at the time, it was considered premature and not well known in the community. And now, uh, as I will explain later, it is considered ready uh, for legislation. So we can think about whether there's a huge difference um, between these two periods. So then we come to stage two, which saw the hospital authority issuing a number of guidelines, including the guidance for HA clinicians on advanced directives in adults, which is issued in 2010 with a model AD form. And this was then updated four years later in 2014 with a shorter version for refusing CPR only. <clears throat> and importantly, it widened the scope of the application of ADs to other end stage irreversible life limiting conditions. And this is also the position taken in the latest legislative proposal, which I'll discuss shortly, and is actually an uncharacteristically broad scope among Asian jurisdictions, which tend to have a more conservative scope of application for ADs. And I'll touch upon this very briefly at the end as well. Daisy, your slide uh, are not advancing. Uh, you haven't advanced it anyway, so you're still on slide. Oh, sorry. Oh, my apologies. Yes, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, okay, so 
Uh, yes, yeah, so, and finally, stage three covers the recent proposals for reform. As most of you may be aware, and also as Calvin mentioned just now, the FHB has issued, um, issued a public consultation paper on 80s in 2019 and a consultation report mapping the way forward in 2020. And significantly, as I mentioned just now, the government considered that it is now an appropriate time to consider AD legislation. So uh, what was the legislative proposal? In terms of the definition and scope, an AD must be made by a mentally uh, person with mental capacity who is aged 18 or above. Uh, following the HA guidance I mentioned earlier, the pre-specific conditions of an AD include terminal illness, a persistent vegetative state or PBS, or irreversible coma, and uh, as previously mentioned, the other end-stage irreversible life-limiting conditions, which is the broader scope I mentioned before. And it's specifically stated uh, that an AD cannot include anything that is against the law, and for our purposes, uh, this includes euthanasia. So an AD will take effect when the person concerned no longer has the capacity to make healthcare decisions. So in terms of formalities, the making and modification of an AD must be in writing to be legally valid. It requires two witnesses, one of whom must be a doctor, and the doctor needs to be satisfied that the person has the capability to make an AD, has been informed of the nature and effect of the AD, and consequences of refusing the treatment specified in the AD. But revocation can be made both in writing and verbally. So if you decide that you don't want the AD to be valid anymore, you want to be saved uh, in, in those uh, or given life-sustaining treatment in those particular circumstances, you can do this verbally. Although if it's made verbally, at least one witness who has no interest in the estate of the person making the AD is required. And a second witness is required for the report of a verbal revocation made by a single family member or carer. A person can also revoke his own AD by tearing it up or otherwise destroying it or asking some other person to do so in their presence or by her direction. There won't be a central registry for ADs like there is in some other jurisdictions, although the government is considering the feasibility of using the existing electronic health record sharing system, or the EHRSS, to store and allow access to AD records by designated healthcare professionals. Now, original AD documents would still be required as proof because storing records in the system is voluntary, and there could be uh, the possibility of a time lag between the latest status of your AD. For example, if you revoke it or modify it and the record in the EHRSS. So um, and in, in addition, given that it may not be practicable to require emergency rescue personnel to first look for the EHRSS record of the AD while carrying out resuscitation at the same time, the government is proposing that the emergency rescue personnel rely on the production of an original AD attached to assigned DNA CPR form. So this would mean that it would be the responsibility of the individual or the family uh, to draw the attention of emergency rescue personnel to the existence of the AD. So um, in terms of safeguards, the original AD, as mentioned, is normally required, which could be a problem um, for some uh, people who say do not want to carry it uh, everywhere. But um, in cases where the treatment provider knows there is a valid AD and the family agrees, it is stated that the AD should be respected. The AD needs to be sufficiently clear and not under challenge. Uh, and there are also safeguards for treatment providers who won't be incurring civil or criminal liability for either way. So either for following an AD they reasonably believe exists or not following an AD they reasonably believe does not exist. So there's a lot of protection for doctors who are uh, faced with this decision as to whether to implement the AD or not. So um, in the interest of time, these are the key features of the proposal I'm going to cover, but what are the, some of the concerns that could arise from these, uh, this proposal or, or the features of this proposal? So the government has made it clear that it's not prepared to enact all encompassing legislation on mental incapacity, which would impact upon areas such as ADs, healthcare decision-making by attorneys, and guardianship, adult guardianship. And it's also unlikely for the government to overhaul the uh, outdated mental health legal regime in Hong Kong anytime soon. So Rebecca and I argue in this chapter that because of this, the piecemeal attempt of the government at codifying the law on ADs is inadequate in two key ways. Uh, the first relates to inconsistencies or ambiguities in existing law. 
So in addition to proposing AD legislation, there are other uh, decision-making tools that you can rely on in Hong Kong. So for example, the government is currently proposing new legislation on continuing powers of attorney, which would cover, which would have, so you would have a power of attorney for someone who would take care of your health, welfare, and other personal matters. And these new laws will add to the decision-making tools we already have, such as the enduring powers of attorneys, some of you may know about this, which deals with financial matters. So this kind of piecemeal approach, adding a bit at a time um, to legal regulation, fails to take into account that these are all, in fact, components in the overall promotion of autonomy of the individual concerned and need to be viewed in this larger context. And without an overhaul of all of these different laws uh, that considers these tools in a holistic manner, there could be ambiguities in the definition of legal terminology and unclear overlapping boundaries or even inconsistencies between these different legal tools. The second concern relates to the assessment of mental capacity. So for those of you who are interested, I gave a presentation on this issue, uh, this uh, specific issue at an earlier CML conference two years ago, and the recording is here um, in the link on the slide, uh, where I go into more detail about the different capacity tests that could be applicable. Um, but the gist of the concern, though, is that the capacity test for ADs, or the test that will be used to assess whether the a, a person making the AD has mental capacity or not is not really elaborated upon. It's just that the person has a capability to make an AD. So what does that mean, right? And there are different formulations of the test that could apply. This includes the test at common law, which is generally understood to be the three steps in the seminal case of Ray C, the test for capacity to consent to treatment in the mental health ordinance, and capacity tests that have been laid out in HA guidelines. So hospital authority guidelines themselves have different uh, capacity tests as well. So while the legislative initiative uh, for ADs is no doubt welcome, the importance of legislating a unified statutory capacity test cannot be understated. And the unwillingness of the government to deal with this issue can cause ambiguity and difficulty in the implementation of ADs by medical practitioners in the long run. So I'd like to briefly move on to talk about the practice of uh, local practice of ADs in Hong Kong, as well as some of the value commitments and social cultural influences that could be affecting this practice. So here on the slide, you can see the number of ADs signed by hospital authority patients between the years of 2012 and 2018. Although, um, do note that these figures do not include, uh, number one, the number of valid ADs received, number two, the number of ADs that were implemented, and number three, the number of ADs produced that were not according to HA's model form. So on their own, these figures here do not tell us too much about local practice, unfortunately. But you'll see that there is a marked increase in the number of ADs signed over these years. Although quite interestingly, in the webinar on advanced directives I mentioned, uh, which took place a couple of years ago, Dr. Jacqueline Yoon argued that this increase is not indicative. She felt this wasn't indicative of an increase in awareness or acceptance of ADs generally, but rather a result of the changing demographic of service users of the HA who take care of a disproportionately high percentage of persons with life-limiting illnesses. So in her presentation at our webinar, Dr. Yoon explained that service utilization of HA hospitals is increasingly being taken up by these patients, particularly in their last year of life, which is further demonstrated by the fact that 90% of deaths occur in HA hospitals. So this interpretation of the data would be consistent uh, with the uh, data in research in the Hong Kong context, which demonstrates both uh, a low awareness and low uptake of ADs. So while um, a low uh, a a lack of awareness about ADs can be explained by inadequate promotion and education, which clearly has been minimal in Hong Kong, an interesting phenomenon observed in Hong Kong is the discrepancy between positive attitudes towards ADs and the actual making of ADs. So for example, um, a Chan et al. study in 2019 found that while 18.4% of their uh, of their study uh, participants, so 368 of them, had heard of um, ADs, so it was a very small percent of them, the vast majority of those, 80.2%, had said they had made or intended to make an AD. Out of those 295 people, however, only 3.7%, so only 11 of them, had actually made an AD. 
So even though not all studies have been able to demonstrate this level of high, uh, high level of positivity and attitude towards ADs, there does remain a significant discrepancy between reported attitudes and uh, actual uptake of ADs. So assuming the positive attitudes are reflective of the patient's participants' true preferences, there seems to be some difficulty translating those preferences into action. And what might be the reasons behind this discrepancy? Um, in our chapter, we briefly explore two of them. The first is uh, resistance from family uh, members uh, uh, or caregivers. And studies have shown that family members often feel compelled to maintain the patient's life, which means that they are unwilling to forego life-sustaining treatment. Arguably, this could be said to stem from a strong belief in Confucian filial piety, which translates into doing everything to save the patient, even if this might not be in line with their own preferences, uh, the patient's own preferences. This kind of resistance from close family members can be a crucial factor contributing to the failure of the person to actually make an AD, because as many academics have argued, the unit of decision making, especially for medical decision making, is generally seen as the family in Chinese culture. So that means if there's strong objection from family members, the person will likely not proceed with the AD, even if it is in uh, their preference. Now, translating this to policy, that means that there is a need to encourage not only education and promotion targeted towards individuals who might wish to make ADs, but also their family members, so that open discussions between family members about one's end-of-life preferences can be encouraged, which will hopefully make family support for ADs more likely, and in turn, individuals more likely to sign ADs. The other big reason that might be causing this discrepancy is the lack of effective communication and coordination on the part of healthcare and other professionals regarding the making of ADs. So in their 2020 study, Chung et al. present a compelling case of what they call unprepared um, healthcare professionals and healthcare system as one of the barriers to advanced care planning more generally. And one of the various examples of this was a patient's experience with an oncologist who kept persuading him to receive treatment despite an expressed reluctance to receive futile life-sustaining treatment. And Chan et al.'s 2019 study, which I briefly mentioned before, also shed some light on how important the role of healthcare professionals actually is. Um, and when asked, the majority of study participants expressed that they would agree to making ADs to varying degrees in the following scenarios. One, if the doctors can provide a clear explanation and recommendation on ADs. Two, if there is effective communication and coordination among uh, doctors at different institutes to execute their decisions. And three, if they could have a thorough discussion and follow up with healthcare professionals about ADs. So this really shows us the importance of healthcare professionals in facilitating the process of making an AD and conversely in discouraging individuals from making ADs. So I've briefly explored the situation in Hong Kong, and I'd like to spend my last few minutes on um, the, uh, some final thoughts about ADs in Asia more generally, and in particular, some findings and trends that were found after surveying the, the jurisdictions in our book, which will hopefully serve as an interesting point of comparison for, for Hong Kong. Although, as Calvin said, the point of today's seminar is not to, to do this um, comparison. So um, some of the key uh, patterns and observations we noticed included a clear trend across jurisdictions being um, the conservative approach that has been adopted in relation to the governance and use of ADs. So most jurisdictions limit ADs to patients with terminal illness, although as we just saw, Hong Kong is an exception to this. And um, in jurisdictions like Singapore, South Korea, and India, this is further limited to instances of determined medical futility, which some have argued adds little deliberative value to the decision to withdraw life-sustaining treatment, which might be made by the doctor anyway. Extensive procedures are often uh, required prior to the implementation of the AD, generally little regard for emergencies, and also a relative lack of explicit duties to implement ADs or any punishment if they are not implemented. So Taiwan was the only jurisdiction in our book with strict penalties for the violation of a patient's AD, but only under one of its uh, two legislative regimes, the older one. There's also a clear trend um, of a lack of awareness and understanding of ADs, even in jurisdictions where there is a clear, detailed, and comprehensive legislative framework. 
And there were some interesting variations as well. So um, variations in the specificity of the regulation on two uh, extremes. So in terms of over-specificity, we had South Korea and Israel that both separated dying into two stages. So essentially dying and then dying imminently. And this distinction was important because it shapes the permitted actions in each stage. And this over-specificity uh, can be paradoxically more ambiguous for doctors for example, because prognoses don't often fall neatly into categories of less than six months or more than six months, or because it's unclear whether an acute disease like pneumonia that could technically cause death within two weeks, um, and it's unclear whether that can be treated, and therefore whether dying imminently uh, is, is warranted, that label is warranted. And then on the side of underspecificity, for example, Japan allows doctors to define what terminal stage is, which the authors argue could result in an inconsistency in application. And then, of course, also a variation in flexibility of form, uh, formalities. In India, uh, the judicial guidelines have a ridiculously um, uh, a large amount of uh, formalities that are required uh, for every single one. They need a judicial magistrate first class to do all of these things that you can see on the slide, which is particularly problematic because there are only a very small number of these JMFCs in any given city, and they are already dealing with a significant backlog of cases. And then on the other hand, uh, Thailand um, has no specific format, uh, no requirement for witnesses, no registration system. So physicians are less likely to be aware of the existence of the AD, and especially whether it was made um, at the time when the inv individual had capacity, because no uh, capacity test is required at the time the AD is made. So uh, just for my last two slides, a couple of points about um, what we discovered in relation to the role of religion and the role of family in these jurisdictions. In terms of the role of religion, there were a wide range of religious traditions represented in the book, including Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism. A common feature among these religions is the sanctity of life principle, but it, didn't, it impacted the development of 80s in different kinds of ways. So interestingly, even in jurisdictions like Israel, where it's made clear that sanctity of life is of utmost importance. This has not precluded the development of ADs, although it has restricted the scope of, of ADs or what's permitted. There's also been a tension between these overarching religious principles guiding the jurisdiction and the needs of practice um, by doctors on the ground. And then we have the role of the family, finally, which was recognized as being highly influential in almost all of the covered jurisdictions, although we argue in our conclusion that the nature and justification for this um, influence was much more nuanced and complex than is typically recognized in the literature. Um, and we saw from these jurisdictions that the family can play different roles um, in medical decision making for different reasons. So some of these roles are here on the slide. So we did find a lot of interesting things in our survey of this jurisdiction, these jurisdictions beyond what I've covered today. So if you are interested in the topic of ADs and advanced care planning more generally, I do hope you have the chance to take a look at the book when it comes out. Um, it is open access due to the generosity of the Wing Funding. So um, that's it from me. I should be just under 25 minutes. And thank you very much um, for, for your attention and uh, I welcome any questions. On this. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Stacey, for this talk, which is broad as well as deep uh, in its scope. It gives me great pleasure, of course, to uh, to welcome our next speaker. So many thanks again, Daisy. Um, our next speaker is Professor Yap Duke. As you see, he has got impressive credentials, particularly on matters pertaining to the welfare of a child. So he has had vast experience uh, in various capacities looking to the uh, welfare of children. And of course, he's going to speak to us on a very uh, difficult matter, doubly difficult, not only because it relates to end of life, but of course, pertaining to a child. Of course, he speaks uh, with great experience, as you see on his biography. So without further ado, it's over to you. So do, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm approaching the issue of preservation of dignity of terminal ill uh, with a focus on the child. And first, I would like to start with some, some observations on dignity, because preservation of dignity uh, leads to the question, what are we meaning with dignity? And there is, in my, at least I couldn't find a, a real clear and satisfying definition of dignity. 
In the Convention on the Rights of the Child, there are two articles that mention explicitly dignity. The one is on children with disability. They have the right to enjoy a full and decent life in conditions which ensure dignity. And the other article is very interesting, is about children in conflict with the law, and they should be treated in a manner consistent with the promotion of the child's sense of dignity and worth. No definition, but you can argue, and some people do that in the circles of children's rights, that there are basic components of human dignity, such as the right to life, physical and mental integrity, and a big issue in that regard, particularly physical and mental integrity, is the prohibition of corporal punishment. A very tough issue in many countries, but the simple answer is every form of corporal punishment is a violation of the dignity of the child. Other components, the right to identity, the interest in autonomy and empowerment and the dialogue. In the right to health, because you're talking about terminally ill, uh, there is no specific mentioning of the protection of the child's dignity. However, the protection from particularly traditional acts that are pre prejudicial to the health of the child can be considered as a, a protection of the child's dignity. Uh, before, yeah, next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, in the discussion about euthanasia, uh, there is a need, and it's my last slide, but you don't need to see it, I can read it. There is a category, end-of-life decisions in medicine. That particular category of decisions to end life in the world of medicine uh, has a different a variety of forms of decisions. One is the withdrawal or the withholding of treatment. The other is the refusal of treatment by the patient. And one is also uh, kind of palliative uh, care, administering pain relief or sedative medication in doses likely to shorten the patient's life. And finally, and that's where I'm going to talk about is euthanasia and physician assisted suicide. Uh, and uh, that particular last form is in fact, the assistance of a physician uh, in the context of the person who is terminating her or his life. Uh, and to avoid all kinds of misunderstanding in the discussion about the practice and the rules in the Netherlands, there are wide exaggerated consideration of that situation. It's a criminal offense. Euthanasia and physician assisted suicide. But there is an exception and that is an exception under very strict conditions elaborated in the Euthanasia Act, which is enforced since 2003. Physicians are the only ones that can uh, perform uh, an act of euthanasia or assist in suicide. And they have to be convinced that the patient's request is voluntary and well considered or well informed, if you want. Uh, that's the first rule. The second is that the physician is convinced that the patient's suffering is unbearable and without prospect of improvement, terminally ill person. That the doctor, the physician has informed the patients about his situation and perspective. Yet uh, he is convinced in a close consultation with the patient that there is no reasonable alternative to the patient situation. The, in other words, it's really the last resort, euthanasia of terminal ill people. Next slide, please. The physician also have to consult at least one other independent physician who has seen the patient, 
and has stated in writing that the attending physician has satisfied the criteria that I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, the physicians, that's one of the uh, other conditions, have exercised due medical pharmaceutical care and attention in the process of ending the patient's life or assisting in his suicide. Euthanasia requests by children aged 12 to 16 can be taken into consideration, into consideration if the child is competent. Requests can be granted provided that the parents or the legal guardians are, uh, are can agree, they don't, they don't give a permission, but that they can agree with the child's wishes. Coming back to the competent child, uh, there is no specific requirement to assess the uh, in a professional assessment of the child's mental and emotional capacities. That's not a requirement under the law. I think we should keep in mind that we are talking about children that most likely already have been under medical treatment for a long time, with a rather full understanding of their illnesses, their terminal illness, uh, the, the terminal nature of their illness, and uh, that there is a close relationship between the physician and the child that is under her or his treatment. So next slide, please. Children age 16 or 17 for a medical treatment of these children, only the consent of these children is required under the Dutch law. This also applies for euthanasia, which means parental approval is not required, but the rule is that the parents or legal guardians should be involved in the decision-making process. Uh, there is for those children, 60, 70, not for children uh, between 12 and 16, but for children age 16 or 17, uh, the, when, when that child uh, is no longer competent to express her or his will, but if he or she, when he or she was still competent, put her or his wish to die on paper, there is a, a written request. The physician can comply with this written request. In other words, that written request is admissible and can be granted under conditions where the child is not uh, capable and not competent anymore to make at that time uh, the decision to terminate her or his life. Children below the age of 12. There is currently a discussion in the Netherlands about the need for a separate set of rules on euthanasia. Uh, keep in mind that children below the age of 12 cannot make independent decisions on their medical treatment. Uh, for that medical treatment is required uh, the uh, consent of the parent or legal guardian of the child. The current discussion uh, tends to what I call the most likely answer. There is no need for that particular separate set of rules. There are, for now at least, very few, if any, cases so far. So there is no information uh, that is needed to draft rules for this particular uh, group of children and their uh, termination of their, uh, their life. Uh, just to give you an impression about what is the frequency of this particular uh, termination of life, the euthanasia decisions by children. Period 2021, 
so almost 20 years, only 16 cases of euthanasia at the request of children in the age category 12 to 18. 13 of those cases were of children age 16 or 17, and only three in the age group 12 to 16. What we also know from the statistics is that with some exception, but the vast majority of all those 16 cases is of children suffering of terminal stage of cancer, one or more forms of cancer. So um, the next slide, please. Now the question of the monitoring of this practice of euthanasia. It's not only a very clear set of rules that have to be met in performing euthanasia, but there is also a rather strict monitoring of the practice. The attending physician who uh, performed the euthanasia or assisted in the suicide has to report every case of euthanasia or physician assisted suicide to the coroner with a reasoned explanation of that particular act. And the coroner forwards this report plus the explanation of the physician to the regional review committee for euthanasia and uh, physician assisted suicide. Uh, the committee concludes that the physician acted in accordance with the requirements that I just mentioned. Then the case is settled. No information about that case goes to the public prosecutor. Keep in mind, euthanasia and uh, physician assisted suicide is a crime. If the requirements are not met, the coroner reports the case to the public prosecutor. And that only happens if all five regional review committees, we have five regional review committees, after they have studied the case separately and they found that the physician's activity was inadequate, meaning he didn't meet all the requirements. Then the case is submitted to the highest body of the public, Dutch public prosecution, that is the Board of Procurators General. And that body ultimately decides whether the physician will be prosecuted. 76 cases in the last 13 years were there where the physician did not act in accordance with the requirement. Only 0.2% of all reported cases in that period. Physicians were interviewed by the prosecutor and resulting in a conditional or unconditional dismissal of the case. So far, none of those physicians have been prosecuted. And I think that is my last slide. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. That's really very helpful and informative. It, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our third speaker, uh, Professor Trudeau Lemon yeah. from the University of Toronto. Uh, as you see here, also similarly distinguished track record uh, in his biography. He's going to speak to us uh, of an important development in Canada now. Of course, this uh, triggered, as you see in his abstract, from a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. So uh, you'd have the judiciary having had an important role in bringing about this important change, leading to, of course, uh, the legislation of the medical assistance in dying or, or made in abbreviation. So with this, thank you so much for joining us bright and early your time, Trudeau, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ho and Professors Lung and Duk. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, to join you here. It's early in the morning here. It's even too early, nearly for soccer games uh, <laughs> during the World Cup. So I will be uh, speaking about the Canadian developments. Um, uh, it, I have a lot of slides, so I will particularly talk about uh, how the Canadian uh, system has developed since the Supreme Court case. 
in um, in 2016. And I would call it a cautionary tale, particularly because of the way in which the Canadian regime has developed. I've personally participated in this debate for quite some time. I'm originally from Belgium and I also speak uh, Dutch. Uh, and so I followed closely the Belgian and Dutch regimes. I, I think there have been certainly in the last 10, 10 years some uh, concerning developments. So that's my personal opinion about that. And I, in the Canadian debate, I, I tried to send also a warning sign about, well, there are, there, there are some uh, components or some risks in the, in the introduction of a practice that you have to take into consideration. Uh, but I think the Canadian debate and the Canadian developments are interesting to look at because it shows how when a constitutional court declares that there is some form of a right to medical assistance in dying, as we call it here, which basically covers euthanasia and assisted suicide, how that can very rapidly evolve and, in my view, create uh, additional problems. And so it's a cautionary tale. I mean, I, I read the case um, that you, around which you, you are discussing this in the, in the context um, which is a tragic case, a typical tragic case, but I, I would, I would caution to think carefully about how to respond to these individual cases. So let me start with um, my presentation. So in 2015, the uh, Canadian Supreme Court um, declared in the case of um, uh, two persons, or basically one person was uh, remaining still in, as, a, as a plaintiff uh, who was suffering from a, a neuro neurological disease, uh, an ALS, that there was a right to physician-assisted death for a competent adult person who clearly consents to the termination of life and has a grievous and irremediable medical condition that causes enduring suffering that is intolerable to the individual in the circumstances of his or her condition. So a lot of the elements that you see reflected in the Dutch and the Belgian laws also with respect to why uh, euthanasia should be allowed in some circumstances. Uh, it also confirmed a right to refuse treatment options, but particularly in the connection with the made request, which actually has, in my view, created a problem that makes the Canadian regime go further than the Dutch and the Belgian regime, this connection of right to refuse treatment at the same time as being able to have a made request. So um, there's suspension of the invalidity by the Supreme Court and, and Supreme Court basically left Parliament one year to introduce uh, a new uh, law that would uh, uh, comply with its, uh, its broad parameters. So the Parliament later used the term medical assistance in dying or made, and so I will refer to that. So keep in mind that captures euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. Uh, interestingly, the Supreme Court confirmed uh, or basically um, accepted the evidence that was produced at the trial level, evidence that was basically uh, from the regimes in Belgium and Netherlands, but, all, but also the United States, uh, physician-assisted uh, suicide regimes, which focus really on, on the end of life. And keep in mind that the Supreme Court only, or the court only had to ask the question, is an absolute prohibition, which, which no, provides for no exemption, uh, for no physician-assisted suicide in the eternal uh, illness context, is that constitutional? So it, it wasn't looking at what should be done by parliament. It's more, is an absolute prohibition um, uh, unconstitutional. And it accepted that the trial judge looked at the evidence and concluded that the adoption of a regulatory regime would initiate not would not initiate a descent down a slippery slope. We should not likely assume that the regulatory regime will function defectively, nor should we assume that other criminal sanctions against the taking of lives will prove important against abuse. I think in the Canadian context, particularly because of the shape of the law and, and, and the rights rhetoric that developed, that this was perhaps a, a, a wrong uh, presumption. Carter involved uh, exceptional cases. So the Supreme Court emphasized from the start uh, that we, they were declaring here that an absolute prohibition was unconstitutional in the context of specific cases that they had before them. So. They said, the judges said, we make no pronouncement on other situations where physician-assisted dying may be sought. They also emphasized that we're dealing with people like Miss Taylor, uh, which was a person with neurological condition uh, approaching arguably her natural death. Um, they also emphasized, because 
before the Supreme Court, new evidence was brought up of recent developments in Belgium, uh, which dealt with uh, euthanasia in the context of mental illness, where uh, an expert witness raised concerns about how the, the practice had been developing since the trial court originally looked at the evidence. So, in, and I, I actually agree that in the last 10 years, certainly in Belgium, and arguably also in the Netherlands, there are some shifts in the practice of euthanasia towards more cases of people who are not approaching their death, uh, including also the mental health context, even though that has a, some degree of uh, uh, um, remained stable in the last couple of years. So they basically said we were not dealing here with, with, with um, cases of euthanasia for minors or persons with psychiatric disorders or minor medical conditions. And I, I read these things as sending a cautionary message that, okay, we think that an absolute prohibition in the type of ALS cases is inappropriate. We don't say anything about other things that's up to Parliament. What has happened is uh, Parliament responded to that. There was a lot of pressure to have a broad medical assistance in dying or a euthanasia regime that would include mental illness, that would include mature minors, that would include situations outside of the end of life context. But Parliament, um, so particularly the Minister of Justice at the time, felt that restraint was uh, permissible to balance uh, basically autonomy with, with protection of vulnerable people and societal interest. So the, the new law put forward that it was trying to balance the autonomy of persons who have a grievous and irremediable medical condition with the need for safeguards that reflect the irrevocable nature of this procedure. So in, in other words, this is not an usual medical procedure. It's irrevocable ending of life. Uh, also, um, recognizing the inherent and equal value of all and the need to avoid by uh, uh, legislating and by regulating the encouraging, encouragement of negative perceptions of the quality of life of persons who are elderly, ill or disabled, and then protection of vulnerable persons from being induced in moments of weakness to end their lives, but also finally and importantly, suicide as a public health issue with impact on individuals, families and communities. So it was basically saying some access is needed, but we have these important other values. Controversial Parliament also uh, defined what a grievous and irremediable medical condition means, and it used that to restrict it, as you see there in the in the um, uh, emphasized uh, criteria, that there had to be an advanced state of irreversible decline in capability, whatever that means. You can discuss that, but also that natural death had to become reasonably foreseeable which is again a vague criteria, but it actually tried to avoid that it would be criticized for being too narrow. So parliament basically wants to send a message. It has to be in the context of the transition between life and death, like a person who is approaching their death. Safeguards were introduced, which are similar to uh, what Belgium and the Netherlands has. Um, uh, requests had to be in writing, independent witnesses, um, that there had to be also, interestingly, a flexible mandatory 10-day reflection period. So flexible because it could be shortened if a person was about to lose consciousness um, or was uh, approaching their death. Um, references, obviously, to the absence of the need for an external, of uh, the absence of external pressure. And in reporting obligations were introduced. Uh, or, or regulations would be allowed to uh, to, in, to impose reporting obligations, which in my view are actually much more um, vaguer, much vaguer and less informative than than the system in the Netherlands. There's some other interesting elements in the 2016 law, as a, as a, let's say as a compromise with those who are pushing for a broad law. The, the law also introduced an obligation for the government to initiate a study on what had to happen with mature minors, what had to happen in the context of advanced requests for, for MAID, for example, for people who are um, developing dementia and, want, and now want to know that they will have access to it. And then finally, mental health as the sole basis for assisted death. In other words, people with mental illness had access to medical assistance and dying to euthanasia in the, under the original law but only if they fulfilled also the other criteria, namely, let's say that they were dying from cancer and mental health would not be an impediment to have access to, to MAID. Uh, 
There's also a sunshine provision which forced Parliament to review the practice after five years. So fast forward, what do we see happening? After the Carter decision came out, we immediately saw that there was, broadly speaking, in the media, but certainly even among um, among medical medical professional organizations, a seeming introduction of, oh, the Supreme Court ruled that there is a right to physician assisted dying, to medical assistant dying, so to euthanasia and assisted suicide. And I've often been struck when I organized at our law faculty seminars where we would invite medical professionals to come and talk about the dangers or, or challenges or, or needed need for safeguards or whatever in the context of, for example, um, uh, MAID or euthanasia for mental illness, that some physicians who really believed in this right rhetoric no longer talked about what are the what are the challenges here they were talking about oh there is a constitutional right we have to treat we have to give a constitutional right to persons with mental illness to have access to medical assistance in time so i would say it led to an abandoning of the ethical and policy related arguments in favor of a rights rhetoric including by some medical uh, associations and including for example the canadian psychiatric association which kept saying without making a clear statement what that meant that people with mental illness should not be discriminated against. Well, what does that mean? So as lawyers, we know that that's, this is a difficult argument to make. Immediately uh, following the act, there was also, uh, there were also legal challenges. There was a legal challenge in British Columbia and a legal challenge in Quebec of people who arguably did not fulfill the criteria for access or not yet. I mean, they were not yet approaching their natural debt and they wanted to know that they would have access now and they challenged the law. It resulted in Quebec, in a decision by a lower court, the Quebec Superior Court 2020, which declared the reasonable foreseeable debt criterion, a violation of the right to life, liberty and security of the person and the right of equality of persons who were not approaching their natural debt. The government refused to appeal the decision, which I think was politically driven, uh, particularly in Quebec. Um, there was a lot, a lot of pressure because the case came from Quebec with uh, two, two persons with, um, with disability who argued that they had to have access to medical assistance in dying. Uh, the elections came up and the Prime Minister Trudeau declared in a, in a political show that they would not appeal the decision and they accepted the, the Quebec, uh, Quebec decision, which is quite unusual considering the fact that the Attorney General normally has an obligation to defend the law of Parliament. So it's not actually normally up to the government to decide we will not defend the law of Parliament. The law had been voted upon just a, a couple of years before. It would have been normal practice actually to challenge and to see what, what the courts, what the, certainly perhaps the Supreme Court would rule. Um, fast forward 2021, in the midst of the pandemic, the government suddenly introduced a new law. Although again, the law was not binding outside of Quebec. It was only binding uh, uh, basically at the same court level in Quebec, not even uh, binding for the Court of Appeal in, in, in Quebec. But in the midst of the pandemic, the government introduced a new law, accepted also r astonishingly, although it said it would, would, would not introduce in the law that mental health could be a basis for access to medical assistance in dying because it, the government indicated that that was too complex to quickly adopt the law in that context. It suddenly accepted a Senate amendment to add mental illness as a basis for medical assistance in dying, based again on this argument, oh, we shouldn't discriminate against persons with mental illness. <clears throat> what resulted? Um, the result of the, of the um, uh, law was uh, with Bill C-7 was that there was now a two-track system in Canada. Track one is for those people who are approaching their natural debt. In the new law, safeguards that were already there were abolished. For example, there is no longer a wait period. The 10-day already flexible period, again, keep in mind the 10-day could be shortened, could be reduced to one day if physicians agreed if the person was about to die. But um, uh, again, this, this push for making it more easy, uh, wait periods were, were uh, abolished. Um, there was an introduction of a um, limited advance request for MAID. So if you already qualified for, um, for medical assistance and dying on the basis of, of an approaching natural death, 
you now could say, I want to have it done if I if, if something happens to me and I can no longer uh, approve consent or confirm consent. So that was track one. Track two now was the new, new uh, access system for people who are not approaching their natural debt. If you look at what that means, it basically means that it was targeting persons with disabilities. Um, uh, and I'll say something about that in a minute. Um, so a 90 day assessment period was introduced, which can be shortened if the physicians agree that they, um, that they could do this assessment shorter. And uh, if, the, if the person uh, might uh, lose capacity in, uh, before the 90 day assessment period was finished was a requirement for one assessor with expertise in a medical condition that caused the suffering, but it was actually not explicitly stated that didn't, this didn't have to be an expert. So you, so say that you have a, a issue of pain, it didn't have to be a pain specialist. It had to be somebody who had expertise, who had worked with, with people in that particular condition, which I think is quite flexible actually, considering the challenges in some uh, medical areas. There were some additional informed consent measures, but which in my view are very limited and, and, and are not as, as, as rigorous as, as in Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, an offer of counseling had to be offered and there had to be uh, a confirmation by the physician that the patient seriously considered other options. But the patient was explicitly allowed, as explicitly allowed under the law, to refuse all other options and still insist on medical assistance in dying. So the physician only has a role as, okay, I agree that the patient seriously considered it, but nothing more. Um, mental illness would be introduced in 2023 because there was a realization that it, um, it was uh, potentially more complex and that maybe additional safeguards may be needed. Um, it also important is that there is no prohibition as you have in New Zealand or in the, uh, Victoria, Australia law to bring up medical assistance and dying for patients. So the Canadian Association of Made Assessors and Providers, which is an organization that is, uh, has received money from the government to train physicians with respect to euthanasia and assist suicide made, uh, even suggests that everybody who might qualify, which is a broad category of people, should be receiving information about MAID. Okay, so um, some of us, including actually the three United Nations Special Rapporteurs and Human Rights Experts, uh, have argued that the de facto focus on uh, the persons with disabilities, the removal of the restriction to end of life as a safeguard but only for persons with disabilities is discriminatory. Why? Because it actually, so why, why is it only persons with disabilities? If you look at, at what, who now has access to medical system dying outside of the end of life context, you have to have a chronic illness, disease or disability with irreversible decline of capability and an irremediable condition, which de facto fulfills the criterion of being a person with disability. So we argue that it's discriminatory and this has been an ongoing debate. So let me now um, have a look at the time. Yeah, so I actually have to wrap up, but I have some quick, some data. I will take you through that very quickly uh, so that you have an idea of what the concerns are and how rapidly it has been evolving. Canada has bypassed in a very short period of time, basically six years, um, the uh, Netherlands and Belgium in terms of the proportion of euthanasia deaths compared to the overall deaths. So we're now at uh, 10,000. Um, uh, deaths per year in 2021, and for the couple of months that the new law was in, in uh, was introduced, we already had 220 people who were not close to the natural debt receiving medical assistance and dying. Uh, so that constitutes uh, relatively high percentages compared to Belgium and Netherlands. We see it in the provinces; these are the pro different provinces in Canada, Quebec, and BC bypassing actually certainly Belgium, uh, I, I actually think uh, close to, to the Netherlands in terms of the proportion of euthanasia deaths of overall deaths in the country. And I would, I would leave it up for further discussion what that means that there is such a wide uh, diversity uh, which is uh, not explained at this point. What is the nature of suffering of those who requested medical assistance in dying? I think again, if you look at, the, at, at why people say that they suffer unbearably, there are concerns from a disability rights perspective. When you look at concepts such as um, uh, 
perceived burden on family, friends, and caregivers, 35% indicated in 2021 that this was one of the basis for their um, unbearable suffering. Loneliness, 17%. Uh, concept of loss of dignity is a very general term, 50, 54%. And then also concerns about inadequate control of pain or concerns about, uh, about con, uh, uh, con, uh, adequate control of pain, which suggest that, that problems with access to adequate care may be a basis actually for a lot of the requests for medical assistance in dying. I'll skip this. Um, what we've seen now in the last couple of years, there's now a parliamentary commission that finally started looking actually in delay at what has happened in the past. From the start, there were some concerns that uh, medical assistance in dying euthanasia was pushed as a form of shame relief, uh, that people were asking for uh, medical assistance in dying because they felt that they couldn't have the adequate care in long-term care hospitals. Um, this has only increased, uh, and I want to simply highlight here two controversial cases that, that I would say uh, represent a, a growing debate in the Canadian uh, context and that has been brought in testimony also before a parliamentary commission as a sign of the system that is has gone off rails. Uh, here on the right, the CTV reported of a 51-year-old Ontario woman with severe sensitivities to chemical to chemicals who asked for medical assistance in dying because she had been on a wait list for affordable uh, 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 adjusted housing for her for several years. Uh, on on the left, you have the story of a 23-year-old son with type 1 diabetes who had recent vision loss, who was approved for me, but it's only because his mom, or dis mom discovered it and went public that the doctor actually got cold feet and withdrew the uh, approval. These are just two stories, and I mean, I had some, some other stories before. So on the bottom here, Michael's choice, was a detailed investigative report of a man who asked for a medical assistance in dying because he was housebound, housebound by pain, poverty, and an incurable disease. So conclusion, many in Canada embraced MAID as a constitutional right. We've seen a rapid normalization of MAID in the end of life context, but increasingly also to address suffering associated with intersecting components of disability, poverty, lack of, or delay in access to adequate care and support. Mental illness will be introduced in 2023. There is a dynamic of expansion with discussions around mature minors and advanced requests for persons with dementia, and a rhetoric of the need to relieve suffering without the acknowledgement of the context and ableist nature of law and existing medical practice in the Canadian context. And finally, there's clearly a discussion now, uh, including with the recent declaration of our Minister of Justice, who basically started to frame it as if the, the, the Supreme Court had recognized the constitutional right to suicide and that the state was now appropriately facilitating suicide of people who, are other, who would otherwise physically or mentally not be capable of doing so. So that was a recent statement two days ago just in the media, which I think is, is, uh, is indicating that Canada has actually um, uh, normalize debt as a form of therapy in a way that the more liberal, the most liberal regimes until now, Belgium and Netherlands, uh, arguably has certainly not done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lemons. Very informative uh, presentation.